The holiday season is often touted as the most wonderful time of the year. Many of us spend this time of year at home with our families or friends, or we might travel to see our loved ones who might be a short walk or ride, a weekend car ride away, or even in distant places. But for some of us, holidays can feel bittersweet. Sometimes getting together with family members is a source of conflict. Some of us go through the holidays alone, and sometimes we think about loved ones who are no longer with us and wish they were still here. As I get older, a number of my relatives have passed away, though others are still here, and I'm eternally grateful for that. And the holidays are one of those times I reflect on the lives of those who have meant a lot to me, yet are no longer here. I've discussed in previous episodes that my father died well over a decade ago, while I was still in grad school. He and I were very close, and while he passed away unexpectedly and relatively young, at 57, there was nothing left unsaid, nothing I regret, so I remember him fondly. Over time, the grief gets easier, but it never truly goes away. Even early on after his death, talking about death in general, or chronic illness, things like that, even talking about what ended his life, never bothered me. Morbid things have never done it for me. The things that take me back to that time, or that make me think about how much I miss my dad, are seemingly random. Certain songs, certain activities, certain events. At a point since his death, it dawned on me that martial arts, particularly watching martial arts in person, is what makes me emotional. Going to the dojo, watching students and senseis practice their forms and spar, that hits me in the feels. It's like I know he's gone, but at the same time I feel his presence. You see, my dad was a third degree black belt in Ishimaru, a style of karate that originated on the Japanese island of Okinawa. Before settling down and having a family, he was super devoted to martial arts, rising up the ranks in his discipline, learning about other martial arts before MMA was a thing, traveling through Asia with friends. Even while growing up, my dad still sought to learn about various types of martial arts and tried to share that with my siblings and me. To be honest, that wasn't something I got into like he did, but I've always found different styles of martial arts beautiful to watch, and practicing them is beneficial, not just in terms of knowing how to fight either. Prior to my deconversion from evangelical Christianity, this appreciation for martial arts was something that, in some evangelical circles, made me feel like an outsider, among so many other things. This wasn't the case in all evangelical circles. For example, my college campus ministry didn't seem to have an issue with martial arts. One of my friends from campus ministry, actually the person who taught me apologetics, also practiced Taekwondo, and if I remember correctly, earned a black belt. But I would also say that my campus ministry experience was both typical and atypical. For context, the ministry was solidly evangelical, but our chapter was mostly Asian. But in other evangelical circles I was a part of, especially predominantly white spaces, martial arts were looked at with suspicion, and some even saw them as satanic because Eastern religions. Even if you weren't out here chanting the Buddha or following Confucius, just practicing martial arts as well as other meditative activities like yoga, were perceived as spiritually dangerous because of ties to other religions and spiritual philosophies. The thing is, Christianity is, for all intents and purposes, an Eastern religion. Christianity didn't start in Europe, and the main figures in the Bible, generally, were not European. And while many of the traditions and practices associated with the Christmas holiday began in Europe, their origins are by no means Christian. I am your host, Jay Poole, and this is the Pastor Podcast War on Christmas 2019. Welcome to Pot Stirrer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide 
and it's not always polite. This is the third annual War on Christmas special, and this year, I want to talk about Christmas itself. Christmas is the Christian holiday commemorating the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, the central figure in Christianity, believed by Christians to be the Messiah, or the Christ, the Savior of the world, and the Son of God, and a co-equal part of the Holy Trinity, God in three persons. Christmas is an important holiday, but within the faith, not the most important. That would be Easter, commemorating the resurrection, Jesus rising from the dead after his execution on the cross. Yet, in the United States, Christmas is generally celebrated as the most popular of Christian high holidays, likely because of the gift-giving aspect, which is thoroughly exploited by retailers, and because it's so close to secular holidays such as Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. Go out in public and see the Christmas-themed decor. Check out all the sales at brick-and-mortar stores. Open up your email to see the ads from online retailers and pleas from charities to give during the season. And most employers, outside of critical services, give their employees the day off on Christmas Day. It is still the one holiday where most businesses, as well as government offices, will be closed. Do other holidays such as Hanukkah, Malid, Kwanzaa receive dedicated time off on the American calendar in the same way Christmas does? Nope. The fact is, Christmas still holds a privileged spot on the U.S. calendar and in our society. Yet for some, particularly evangelical Christians and the politicians and pundits who serve them, Christmas is under attack by individuals, businesses, and government institutions, recognizing that Christmas isn't the only holiday celebrated towards the end of the year. And not all people, and truth be told, not even all Christians, celebrate Christmas, but by a simple, inclusive, happy holidays and labeling end-year celebratory events holiday parties instead of Christmas parties, acknowledging in a small way that other holidays and other belief systems and philosophies exist, Christmas, and therefore Christianity, is under attack. Thing is, much of the Christmas holiday, which evangelicals believe needs their defense, is not even Christian in origin. So they're seeking to protect traditions that originate in other holidays and practices from other religions. So what are they even protecting? For this episode, I used a number of sources, which will be listed in the show notes, but I sourced a lot from a book called The Medieval Christmas by Sophie Jackson. It's a really fascinating book about the origins of many Christmas traditions. I definitely recommend it. First, let's talk about Christmas itself. Christmas is the celebration of Jesus' birth. It is observed by Roman Catholics, most Protestant denominations and sects, as well as the Greek Orthodox and Bulgarian Orthodox churches on December 25th. However, most other Eastern Orthodox churches, such as the Russian Orthodox, as well as most Oriental Orthodox churches, such as the Ethiopian Orthodox and the Coptic Orthodox churches, celebrate Christmas on January 7th. The difference in Christmas observance dates is based on different calendar systems used in each of these Christian traditions. But despite the observance of Christ's birth being held at a particular date each year, it is not known conclusively when he was born. Many scholars believe Jesus was born somewhere from 6 to 4 BCE, meaning that placing his birth between 1 BCE and 1 CE would likely be inaccurate. And more importantly for the topic at hand, what date was he born? Based on details in the Bible, such as the birth of John the Baptist, the alignment of the North Star, and the inclusion of shepherds in Jesus' birth story, as well as historical details known about relevant figures, such as King Herod, Estimates vary widely from March to September. Yet, despite the variation in estimates given for Jesus' birth, few scholars believe Jesus was born on December 25th or anywhere near that time. So why, for most Christians, is Christmas celebrated on December 25th? For that, we had to go back in time to a world that had not yet been Christianized. Cultures around the world have historically celebrated the winter solstice, the first day of the winter season. 
The winter solstice is the shortest day of the year, meaning it has the least daylight and it stays dark the longest. In the Northern Hemisphere, winter solstice is in December. In the Gregorian calendar, which is the calendar used in most of the world today, including the United States, the winter solstice falls on December 21st or 22nd. This year, it falls on Sunday, December 22nd. The winter solstice has been a time of celebration in many societies, including in Europe, and was also dubbed midwinter. Generally, this was a celebrated time of the year because since it was the shortest day of the year, it was a sign of the increased daylight in the days, weeks, and months to come. So it was essentially a sign of rebirth. In Viking era Scandinavia, the midwinter celebration was called Yule or Yuletide. Yule consisted of Norse rituals that would appease Thor, the god of thunder, so the sun would return. These rituals would be performed during the 12 days of Yuletide. In addition, the Yule log would be burned during the entirety of Yuletide. This wasn't some wood you throw into your fireplace. This would be a huge hunk of tree, and it had to burn for 12 days. The Yule log had importance for three reasons, two religious and one practical. The Yule log was expected to be hauled in by all who were able-bodied, and all who helped to bring in the log would be protected from witchcraft for the coming year. Also, in the Norse religion, the log must burn for the entire 12 days in order for the sun to return. And considering how cold Scandinavia is, this was a pretty big deal. The last reason was a huge deal too. Having the log burn for the entirety of the 12 day celebration would ensure that the Vikings wouldn't have to go out into the darkness and chop down more trees for fuel. With the Christianization of Scandinavia in the 1100s CE, the 12 days of Yule were transformed into the 12 days of Christmas, and Yule became a wintertime log set ablaze in the fireplace, as well as inspiration for a popular Christmas pastry. Yule also was, at one time, a synonym for Christmas. Ancient Rome was the home of another winter festival predating Christianity, called Saturnalia. Saturnalia was the celebration of Saturn, the Roman god of agriculture and time. Like Yuletide in Scandinavia, Saturnalia was a pagan holiday that was organized around the winter solstice. Saturnalia started out as a single day on the Roman calendar, but in the late Republic period, which was from 131 to 33 BCE, the holiday was expanded to a week-long festival, starting on the day of the winter solstice, which according to the Julian calendar used at that time, was December 25th. Everything stopped for Saturnalia, all work and business, schools, courts, and other normal activities. Even slaves were permitted not to work and were allowed to participate in the holiday. People decorated their homes with wreaths and other natural decorations and wore colorful clothes known as synthesis. According to history.com, Romans celebrated Saturnalia by gambling, singing, playing music, eating and socializing, as well as exchanging gifts. Then on the final day of Saturnalia, called the Sigillaria, Romans often gave their friends and loved ones small terracotta or wax figurines, also called Sigillaria. The gift-giving, singing, feasting, and celebratory aspects have their origins in Saturnalia. The use of holly, ivy, and mistletoe during Saturnalia inspired the use of evergreen for other midwinter celebrations, leading to the eventual adoption of the evergreen Christmas tree as part of Christmas festivities. The 4th century CE is a very important period when discussing Christianization of Europe and the development of Christmas. These developments go hand in hand. Christianity had been a religion at this point for around 300 years and was seen as a small offshoot or sect of Judaism, practiced mostly underground in parts of the Roman Empire, on the western edge of the Middle East, in Asia Minor, and the Greek and Italian Peninsula. These regions were part of the Roman Empire, which was hostile to Christianity, as well as most other religions outside of their own Roman polytheistic religion. Christianity was also practiced in parts of northern Africa and northern parts of sub-Saharan Africa, 
Africans were among the first Christians. But we're going to focus mainly on the Roman Empire in this episode. By the 4th century, the Roman Empire encompassed much of Western Europe, as far north as England and Wales, all down the western coast of Europe into Spain, and all of southern Europe and the Middle East west of the Caucasus Mountains. The empire also included all lands surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, including the coastline of North Africa as well. And I'm saying this just to give you a mental picture, because the geography here will be important. In the year 313, the Roman Emperor Constantine I, also known as Constantine the Great, who controlled the western provinces of the Roman Empire at the time, entered into an agreement with rival Emperor Licinius, who controlled the eastern provinces. This agreement was called the Edict of Milan. In it, they agreed that Christianity, as well as other religions, would no longer be persecuted within the empire, and property confiscated from Christians, including churches and other lands, would be returned to them. From then on, Constantine would enact policies favoring Christians in particular, while Licinius was following the edict to the letter. The edict was actually drafted by Licinius. Eleven years later, Licinius would be defeated by Constantine's army and then executed, and the Roman Empire would be reunified under Constantine. So at this point, the entirety of the Roman Empire was under the rule of Constantine. In 325, Constantine brought together the First Council of Nicaea, a communion of Christian bishops, and this was significant in that out of it came the first part of the Nicene Creed, a statement of orthodoxy, or correct belief, held by almost all Christian traditions, even to this day. Constantine died in 337, and according to Christian historians, was baptized into Christianity on his deathbed. It is disputed by scholars as to if Constantine was a Christian during his reign or if his giving favor to Christianity was for political purposes. Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire a few decades after Constantine's death in 380 with the Edict of Thessalonica. In early Christianity, there was no standardized celebration of Jesus' birth. It was debated within the faith when Jesus was born and whether or not it should even be celebrated at all. In 221, early Christian historian Sextus Julius Africanus was the first to declare December 25th the date of Christ's birth. It is unclear what led him to this conclusion. A couple of possible reasons include that early Christians wanted to appropriate the symbolism of rebirth from the winter solstice holidays, and that the vernal equinox, which falls in late March, was adopted as the moment of Jesus' conception. But it's hard to know for sure. Celebrating Christ's birthday, whenever it was, was not widely accepted in early Christianity because the celebration of birthdays was a feature typical of pagan holidays, whereas the early church was more apt to celebrate days of martyrdom, or dying for the faith. As a matter of fact, the First Council of Nicaea in 325 nailed down when Easter would be celebrated each year, but Christmas doesn't appear to have factored in here. The first Christmas celebration wasn't held until 336 in Rome. Later in the century, the early church agreed to add Christmas officially to the church calendar with the December 25th date. Christianity becoming the state religion in the Roman Empire meant a fast track for Christianity spread throughout the Mediterranean and Europe. One of the challenges was that the locals held their own long-standing traditions, their own belief systems, their own deities, their own holidays. Of course, the church, by now a powerful force in the empire, could convert people by the end of a sword. And that happened too. But it's easier to enforce a change by absorbing or merging existing beliefs into the newly introduced system. The process is referred to as religious syncretism. Particularly in relation to Christmas, most cultures in the region the Roman Empire encompassed and beyond participated in some kind of midwinter celebration around the winter solstice in or around late December. And these were generally big deal holidays. It was easier for the church to incorporate Saturnalia and later other winter solstice traditions such as Yule into the Christian holiday referred to as the Mass of Christ's Day or Christmas. 
The Roman Empire gave Christianity a huge jumpstart and a legitimacy that helped it spread across the lands that encompassed the empire. But at this point in history, Rome was in decline. To make a very long story super short and simple, the Roman Empire devolved over a few hundred years, being backed by a bunch of small tribal strongholds and falling apart from within, and throwing climate change. Collapsing in 476, the fall of Rome created a bit of a power vacuum, and eventually in Europe, the church would grow to fill that vacuum. Christianity continued its spread across Europe over the next several hundred years, and it spread elsewhere as well, co-opting pre-Christian traditions along the way. We can't talk about the development of Christmas without discussing jolly old Saint Nick himself, Santa Claus. Santa Claus is thought to be based on Saint Nicholas of Myra, a bishop from the 4th century. Nicholas was born in Lycia, in modern-day Turkey. His parents were wealthy, devout Christians, and Nicholas himself grew up a committed believer. But while he was still a young man, both of his parents died. Nicholas was now a young person with a huge inheritance on his hands. Many of us can picture someone in his position blowing his wealth on partying or whatever else young 4th century guys would do back then. But Nicholas was different. He chose to use his inheritance to discreetly help those he came across who were in need. Nicholas was also known for his continued devotion to his faith, attending Mass regularly in the town of Myra, located in Lycia, and becoming a priest. When the bishop in Myra died, Nicholas, who according to legend was the first priest who walked through the door, was selected to be the bishop. Nicholas was also purported to have been imprisoned by the Roman Empire until the reign of Constantine. He was also said to be at the First Council of Nicaea, but both of those claims are debated by religious scholars. One of the most famous legends regarding Nicholas is called the Miracle of the Poor Girls. This story involved a man who could not afford to support his three daughters and did not have a dowry that would allow the young ladies to get married. Some accounts even state that without this dowry, the daughters would have to be forced into sex work. Nicholas caught wind of this family's difficult circumstances and he secretly left one bag of gold at a time one for each daughter, ensuring a dowry for each to marry and an improvement in the family's circumstances. Each was left in a stocking by the fireplace. For the youngest daughter, the father waited up to see who was giving them this gold. Because it was winter, the windows were closed, so Nicholas couldn't just climb into the window. So he decided to instead climb on the roof and drop the bag of coins down the chimney where they landed in the stocking. Nicholas has been a popular saint for generations, best known as the patron saint of children, but is also regarded as the patron saint of sailors, brewers, the imprisoned, and a number of other groups, and is recognized as a saint by both the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. His feast day is December 6th, less than three weeks before Christmas. So how did we get Santa Claus? While what became Santa Claus is tied to St. Nicholas of Myra, particularly his reputation for giving and components of the miracle of the poor girls, such as the secret giving, the chimney, and stockings, many of the building blocks of the Santa Claus figure come from much older legends, particularly in Scandinavia and Germanic Europe, that predate the Christianization of these locations. The earliest links were with the Norse god Odin, who, according to Viking mythology, rode through the night sky on a horse named Sleipnir and would deliver rewards to the good and punishment to evildoers. Scandinavian children would leave food out for Sleipnir to encourage Odin to stop by and leave gifts. Odin was the foundation for the legend of Old Man Winter, a popular mythical figure in pre-Christian Europe. When these areas of Europe were Christianized, St. Nicholas would become the gift giver during his December 6th feast day, but 
not only based on the details of his legend, but also melded in with details of the preceding European myths of Odin and Old Man Winter, including the old man with his pet steed flying through the night sky, giving gifts to good people and giving bad people their due, the children leaving out food, which later morphed into cookies and milk. Now, for as to how St. Nicholas went from a regional saint to becoming part of Christmas, Nicholas was entombed at his church in Myra after his death in 343. And for centuries, he was viewed as a popular local saint, but not so well-known outside of Turkey. But in 1087, his remains were stolen by Norman pirates and bought to Bari, a city in southern Italy, to be reinterred as relics for part of a new basilica. The justification given was that advancing Muslim armies were about to take over Myra, so the remains were moved for safety purposes. But one thing to keep in mind is that at this time, the remains of saints were a huge draw for Christian pilgrims. St. Nicholas's relocation meant more people were exposed to his legend, and he ended up with a following of his own in Europe. When his legend was melded with the pre-Christian European myths, observance of gift-giving associated with St. Nicholas moved from his feast day to Christmas. The Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s meant that the celebration of St. Nicholas and other saints fell out of favor, especially in parts of Europe that went along with the Reformation and became Protestant strongholds. In Northern and Western Europe, the gift giver was no longer St. Nicholas, but instead mythical sidekicks and evil counterparts that developed over the centuries, such as Krampus, Ruklaus, Aschenklaus, Pelsenickel, Svatopit. But some places, such as the Netherlands, had not completely given up on St. Nicholas, or as they called him, Sinterklaas. Dutch colonists brought Sinterklaas, later anglicized to Santa Claus, with them to the U.S. colonies. Santa Claus initially didn't take hold with most colonists. New England tended to not celebrate Christmas. As a matter of fact, the Puritans pushed to ban the holiday. And in other colonies, Christmas was celebrated as a feast similar to Saturnalia. So a lot of reveling, eating, drinking, feasting, and without a Santa Claus or Father Christmas figure. But during the 19th century, authors and artists began to revive these legends associated with Christmas and remaking them into family-friendly narratives. This meant that Santa Claus would make a comeback. St. Nicholas, along with the pre-Christian European myths and the secular helper figures popular after the Protestant Reformation, would be brought together, along with an artistic makeover that, by the late 19th century, gave us modern-day Santa Claus, or jolly old St. Nick. Santa Claus, the large, jolly old man with rosy cheeks, with helper elves flying through the night of Christmas Eve with his reindeer, struggling down the chimney to give gifts to good little boys and girls, and coal to bad little boys and girls. The Christmas that American evangelicals are fighting to defend isn't entirely rooted in Christianity. Much of what has become Christmas is rooted in European religious beliefs and practices that predate Christianity and the celebration of Jesus' birth, as well as secular traditions that have developed alongside it. I think back to how, when I was an evangelical Christian, some evangelicals I knew, particularly white evangelicals, worried about the influence of Eastern religion on Christian spirituality and practice. And that tends to be an undercurrent of American evangelicalism. The fear of spirituality that isn't explicitly Christian, especially the unfamiliar. We can see it in the discomfort many evangelicals have with not only yoga, martial arts, and meditation, but also other belief systems melding Christianity with beliefs and practices originating outside of the faith, such as Santeria and Christian expressions of Buddhism. Yet, whether evangelicals acknowledge it or not, Christianity itself has a long history of syncretism. The development and evolution of the Christmas holiday is a prime example. The only difference, particularly when it comes to Western Christianity, is that what was co-opted and accepted as tradition was primarily European in origin. 
And this cognitive dissonance can be chalked up to a lack of awareness. But it can also be a symptom of the tendency of American Christianity, especially American evangelicalism, to conflate Christianity with Western or European culture. The supposed war on Christmas is but one front on the real assault on our society from those who believe in Christian dominionism. Dominionism is a subset of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is the belief that society should be governed by and reflect the will of Christians, and in just about all contexts, is right-wing, from conservative to far-right on the political spectrum. Dominionism is a term more specific to the U.S. context. According to the Political Research Associates website, dominionism is, quote, the theocratic idea that regardless of theological view, means, or timetable, Christians are called by God to exercise dominion over every aspect of society by taking control of political and cultural institutions, end quote. Dominionism includes the belief that the United States began as a Christian nation, there is no separation of church and state, and that Christians have a right and mandate to rule according to their interpretation of biblical principles. Those outside of what are considered true Christians, defined by them, are considered a threat. Of course, this would include atheists, agnostics, and people of different religious faiths, but it also includes other Christians who do not have the same beliefs as them, and those who have historically been viewed with suspicion. This part ties into why Christian dominionism has been linked and has sympathies with white nationalism, and why Christian dominionism tends to be associated with white evangelicals, though not all dominionists are white or evangelical. The development of the church in the United States is inextricably tied with the history of race and ethnicity in this country, and as a result, churches are still largely segregated. To dominionists, racial and ethnic minorities, particularly people of color in religious leadership positions and their congregants, are viewed as practicing a politicized, divisive, or flawed Christianity. This is what is primarily at the root of why, among adherents to dominionism, black religious leaders such as Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton are derided, while Robert Jeffress and Franklin Graham are celebrated and amplified. What is particularly dangerous about dominionism is their rejection of pluralism, governance by diverse groups with varied interests, and their willingness to reject democracy if it is not working in their favor. Dominionism essentially advocates theocracy. Over the past 40 plus years, dominionists have been on a mission to control all areas of public and private life. The fights against abortion rights, against public schools, against rights and liberties for LGBTQ people, the push for homeschooling and the funneling of public funds to privately run charter schools, the support for the splitting of refugee families and funneling of Central American children to adoption services to be reacculturated in white Christian families, their suppression of women's rights and agency, and especially their undying worship of authority without accountability, whether it be church leaders caught in hashtag MeToo scandals or secular leaders from the president to the police. And of course, this list is by no means exhaustive. And why is this coming to a head now? The fact is that these views have been bubbling underneath the surface for a very long time. Part of it is because as a country, we have yet to truly face and deal with our past, particularly when it comes to race in a real way. And a lot of this is reactionary. There was a time when the social order was firmly in place, but with the various social movements of the 20th and 21st centuries, civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, plus the changing demographics of this country, other voices are demanding to be heard and addressed as equals. And due to immigration and birth rate differences, white people are expected to become minorities by 2045. And white evangelicals, those who make up most of the dominionists, will be a smaller percentage still. This is why they support Donald Trump and choose to embrace delusion in the name of alternative facts. For dominionists, supporting a corrupt, racist, misogynist con man is a feature, not a bug, 
It's not about piety, it's about position. It's about maintaining and expanding on power and control when their population share in our democracy doesn't justify it. And what better person to lead the charge politically than someone who represents the worst in themselves? I would be remiss if I didn't mention anything about the times we're in right now. As of this recording, Donald Trump has become the third president in our history to be impeached by the House of Representatives. The other impeached presidents were Andrew Johnson in 1868 and Bill Clinton in 1998. We're going into the holiday season amid a grave and pivotal time in our country's history. And while the war on Christmas, in the grand scheme of things, is a much lighter subject than impeachment, it is also one of the many fronts where Dominionists are fighting for control, as if every hill is a hill worth dying on. But they are not just fighting in Jesus' name, they are fighting for the supremacy of white European culture on stolen land that is diversifying whether they like it or not. On December 31st, I'm coming out with a special end-of-the-year episode. It'll include a year in review and a discussion of what we might see in the coming year. 2020 is a big year for U.S. politics, and with Donald Trump's impeachment, that adds some additional unknowns to the race. And to gear up for what's going to be a wild year, Potstirer Podcast will take off the month of January for regular episodes. If you subscribe at the $5 level or above on Patreon, flyingmachine.network slash support, I will still release a January bonus episode of the podcast. Then in early February, Potstirer Podcast will hit the ground running as we'll be heading towards the 2020 general election. I'm here for it. I hope you are too. Thank you very much for listening to Potstirer Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcast app. Go to potstirerpodcast.com slash download and you'll see the links. So much choice. If you subscribe, you can get new episodes once they come out so you don't miss them. If you enjoyed the podcast, please give us five stars and leave a review. I love to tweet, so follow me on Twitter at potstirercast. And for everything Potstirer Podcast, potstirerpodcast.com is the one-stop shop, so check it out. I'm Jay Poole. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Have a wonderful, joyous, and safe holiday season. I give you the incredible flying machine.